You are listening to Beyond the Verse, a Star Citizen podcast. A show dedicated to Cloud Imperium Games, Star Citizen, and Squadron 42. Whether you fight, explore, unite, and or trade, we bring you news, updates, interviews, reviews, and analysis. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a pour of Radagast, and join us as we go Beyond the Verse. Launch sequence activated. Hello, friends, and welcome to Beyond the Verse Star Citizen Podcast. I'm your host, Solus, and on today's episode, we're going to be moving a little backwards. We usually end with Inside Star Citizen. We're going to start with Inside Star Citizen because it covers all things Xenothreat. And for the last several weeks, we've been covering nothing but Xenothreat. So we had Xenothreat Part 1, Part 2. In this episode, we're calling it by the code name Hexpentrator. We'll learn more about that in the Inside Star Citizen video. But after that, we'll get into my impressions, my reactions to wave one of the EPTU patch 323 drop um, that I've been able to dabble in myself personally. Um, we'll get into uh, just quickly like the RSI launcher 2.0. I'm going to show it to you for those on YouTube. We're going to get into Citizen Con tickets, which yours truly is still not going not planning on it anyways Uh, but the ticket drop happened starting yesterday so we'll cover that very quickly Um, and then we're going to end with the pu monthly report the march monthly report and then the whitley's guide the vulture so we're going to end with lore kind of how we used to do it in the first couple episodes of the show so I hope this finds everybody well. Um, I mean, in a regular conversation, I would ask how you're doing and how was your week since last we spoke. But um, the, the, I guess the downside of a podcast is it's a monologue. So um, something else to look forward to real quick. Um, next, I guess Sunday, actually this Sunday in two days, um, I will be on Space Tomatoes podcast as well. And we're going to be talking things like 323, what to expect, the engineering gameplay loop, which is available now in Arena Commander for those on the EPTU patch 323 build. So I'm excited about that. Um, Most of my listeners also listen to Space Tomato. So I'm going to talk to you here in a couple of days. Really excited about that. But first from the community so two weeks ago i say two weeks ago last week we did episode 52 xeno threat part two we asked a q a and we did ask a poll so first to the polls the question was asked which fauna are you most excited about in 323 so remember uh last week's update was like two weeks worth because i had uh, i had missed a week for work and we had covered all the alien species right the bird and the little i don't know tiger looking thing and so I asked uh, your favorite fauna. It was the Copian, which is the ground uh, animal, and then the Maroc, the Maroc, Maroc, uh, which is the flying animal. Uh, and it was pretty one sided. 80% of the votes went to the Copian, uh, Copian and 20% went to the Maroc. So people like their ground aliens over the bird aliens. Uh, I will say, uh, technically, like game wise, I'm a little nervous about the flying birds. Um, Because I'm just interested how they're going to react with us flying around. Um, I don't know, like flying through the clouds in Crusader and there's a freaking space wall that comes out in front of you. You wipe, restart from a hab, and (laughs) I don't know, what does that process look like? Um, And then does that become a game loop in and of itself, right? Spearing space wells <laughs> um so the bird thing is kind of interesting to me i agree with this poll and then we also asked a q a of the upcoming modularity in 323.x which modular ship are you most excited about so here we go um, the first response was from a user kra cra 4718 um they said the galaxy and i'm just going to keep going through this pretty quick so the galaxy um groza says the galaxy baby however mr roberts please consider adding a dungeon modular option so i can make sure gold team never leaves me hugs and kisses all right so a little bit of an inside joke there uh in soul provision our org we have fire teams fire team alpha bravo charlie delta so that we can you know obviously break 
up comms and break up operations and he is because he's one of our officers he is a gold team leader right very star wars-esque uh, but that's the gold team piece the dungeon piece i don't know that, that gets a uh, gets pretty pretty interesting i don't know what he means by uh by dungeon please explain groza all right the next one disowned speaking specifically for ships already released good twist i'm most excited for the caterpillar and the carrick both would be amazing with different modules attached so that's interesting i didn't even think about the carrick um, and honestly the caterpillar either so the carrick has those three massive what they're calling cargo bays they have these three massive bays that i've always just considered as cargo i didn't consider that you could replace each one of those with its own modularity it's super interesting to me and i think that will make it more competable competitive there you go <laughs> it'll make it more competitive uh, with the odyssey so i think for pure exploration reconnaissance surveillance i think the odyssey um, is probably going to be the better of the two but having those three modular components on the carrick is going to be um it's going to be interesting you could have like a well you already have a medical bay so the carrick might actually be freaking phenomenal when they introduce modularity it already has a medical bay inside of it so then you have three other options additional options to put underneath it super awesome and then the counter pillar caterpillar good lord um didn't think about that one either but yeah i guess that makes sense because each one of those it's almost like the carrick each one of those in like the nose of the caterpillar could be exchanged for modularity very very interesting to sound and then our last comment from Nick, for the most part, the galaxy. I know it won't be out uh, out for a time, but I'm still excited about it. I'm interested in the different amount of ships that will be modular. Yeah, so the galaxy, that's a lot of responses. I personally agree with the galaxy being um, kind of the kind of the greatest modular ship and it's it was completely designed for modularity in mind. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I already have this prepped and ready to go. But here's the Galaxy. It's an RSI ship and it is very, very sleek. Um, it's almost like, I think a Star Wars and maybe like the Interceptors or uh, I want to say Star Destroyers, but it's that very like sleek angular design, kind of thin if you were to like smash a ship from top to bottom. It's very, very sleek and slender. Um, it, it's also reminiscent of like the Zeus's that are about to come out right so it has that same aesthetic but let's just read it real quick the galaxy featuring a fully modular design and an onboard hangar capable of deploying small ships the cutting edge galaxy has versatility built into its dna with a highly configurable main deck that can be outfitted with comprehensive facilities to support cargo medical or refining operations so what's interesting about this ship is you also have to buy the modular um, components. And now that I'm talking, I'm also reminded of the Endeavor, right? So the Endeavor, you have to buy each one, unless you have the ultimate pack, you have to buy each one of the modular extensions or like two by twos or one by twos or whatever configuration, right? This is probably gonna be the same way. In fact, I know for a fact it's the same way because if you were an early pledger, for the galaxy you had the option of getting those extra components right so <clears throat> you do have to buy them separate we don't know much about modularity in this current moment we don't know if it's going to be uh, part of an orbital station loop where while you're at the orbital station that is where you would do your exchanges how long it's going to take the cost to do it a lot of the details are not uh, available at this time but what a great idea to have somebody on from CIG to talk more about it <laughs> when we get closer to time. So I'm still sharing my screen. Just wanted to go through some of the images. Again, this is a very beautiful ship. Um, it's black with, it almost looks like gold highlights, um, but I think it's just light reflecting. It's mainly blue highlights. So dark black, dark grays. I guess black is dark. So black, dark grays, uh, and blue highlights. So gorgeous all around, in my opinion. This is going to be a phenomenal ship. Honestly, it's probably going to be my everydayer. Um, where the Idris is sexy, where um, I don't know, even like the Hammerhead is like sexy. Like these are very military minded. I think taking like an RSI Galaxy and putting like everyday use game loops on it uh, would make it my everydayer. 
So I'm just going through more of the pictures. Here is an image of the RSI galaxy in space, um, but it is retracting. I'm assuming it's retracting. It's pulling in prospector bags. So you got a prospector that's flying underneath it and there's a um, gravitational pull. I'm going to call it like maybe tractor beam, but it's pulling those um, prospector bags up into its belly. So interesting imagery. <laughs> uh, here is it in combat. I am curious. I am curious what it um, what it's going to do or how it's going to perform in combat because it still has to defend itself. Right. Uh, looks like cargo operations. Here's the next one of it in its hangar. Nothing really exciting or special there. Here's it flying. Um, here's the inside of it with a Kovalec shipping container, which game loops, distribution centers, all the above. Cannot wait uh, for the galaxy. Uh, this is the medical bay uh, attachment that you see inside. Uh, it looks like it also has like cargo. So cargo for, I guess, medical supplies, super interesting. Hadn't even thought about cargo and medical being one and the same. Um, here's another room, and then we get into a small ship, the Pisces, exiting out the rear of the RSI galaxy. So super interesting for those of you ship nerds who really want to uh, to see the, the technical overview or the hard points, here you go. I'm not gonna go through all of it. Um, it's your basic like large ship, right? Specifications, it is large. Uh, so I was right there. Cargo capacity is only 64, but I'm pretty damn sure that's without the cargo modular adapter or extension or whatever we're calling it, modules. There you go. So I just wanted to take a second and get into that because if I just said galaxy, and for those of you listening that might not be familiar, this is your first time listening, now you know all there is to know about the galaxy. It was pledgeable you were able to pledge for it last year um, and again there hasn't been much information since then all right let's go to twitter i only had two polls this uh this past week i wasn't as aggressive with my polls as i was last episode um so here we go remember that last week right not this week last week they uh the april fool's joke with a misc raptor so I, uh, I asked the question, it was actually right after the podcast, I asked the question, um, had this been a legit ship to purchase, would you have? CIG has already confirmed this is an in-game asset, would you want to see it come to Star Citizen? And so, you know, almost 800 views, 134 votes, 71.6% they would have bought it. All right, 28.4% said absolutely not. I don't know. Uh, at some point, <laughs> you've spent so much in this game. Um, what's another, you know, 30, 40 bucks? I would not buy it for more than 50, 100%. I think the mule being 40 or 45, whatever it was when the mule came out was too expensive. I think ground assets should be, you know, between 25 to 50, quite honestly. But a, uh, a ship to clean up... Um, people's mess like that can't be 50 bucks <laughs> so if it was less than 50 i'm part of the crowd that probably would have bought it um but that's just, that's interesting that's if cig is listening we will literally buy anything clearly right 72 percent was said they would have bought the april fool's joke that's insane okay and then the second question what are you more excited about happening tonight okay so this was yesterday uh yeah this was yesterday so Wave one EPTU patch 323 drops. Um, and this is two days ago. Sorry. This is two days ago. Um, it drops. I'm able to get in. I'm playing it. And somebody mentions to me, you know, oh, I, I forgot Fallout on Prime is coming out tonight. And so I'm like, holy crud. Between The Last of Us last year and now Fallout. This is this is a phenomenal time to be a gamer uh, and watching TV. Like the fact that Amazon has come out with I think ten episodes of Fallout is incredible. I'm super stoked for both. I had actually had a dilemma: do I stay in 323 and kind of dabble and play, or do I grab my wife and go watch Fallout? And my wife is that caliber person who will watch Fallout with me, so I'm lucky there. <laughs> very lucky there but we did we stopped we sat down and watched the first two episodes of fallout freaking loved it and during the first episode i wrote this uh i wrote this poll 
So what are you more excited about happening tonight? The wave one of EPTU or Fallout on Prime? So about 537 views, just under 100 votes. Uh, 76% go for the EPTU, 323 wave one, and 24% goes for Fallout on Prime. So not necessarily, you know, uh, Star Citizen solely focused, but I thought it was just a fun, uh, a fun survey. And before we move on even further to get into this week in Star Citizen, um, happy Eclipse Day. Like, I would love to hear what you did for the eclipse or maybe some of your experiences for the eclipse. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas. My kids were able to, they were at school, so they were able to take, I think it was 30 minutes of their day. They sent them outside to a, an additional recess. Um, and from where my wife and I were watching the eclipse, we could hear the school cheering whenever the totality hit. So it was very special knowing that my son was out there. My daughter is a little further away at a different school, uh, but they were able to see the solar eclipse. That was exciting. But my wife and I, we uh, in our neighborhood, there's this lake, uh, kind of retaining pond, but it's a uh, it's a lake for all intents and purposes. So we walk out there, we just kind of experience it for like 15 minutes. Um, and it wasn't like for us, it wasn't so much about the couple of seconds of totality. It was how eerie the environment got. Like it, I don't know. Um, have you ever seen like an HDR uh, screen or a movie where it's just, it's initially very bright. Like the, the whites are white. It's almost, uh, I don't know, like a lens flare. That's what it felt like when I walked out of my house, headed to the lake. It's like things just seemed off it felt weird the lighting was off it was weird um so i thought that was that was super interesting for the beginning of it and then as we got closer to to to, to, to totality it's a lot of t's there when we got closer to totality um yes it got dark yes it became nighttime everything around us became pretty much as it was at night so i thought that was crazy uh, but then obviously totality hit you could using your glasses um you were able to look up and you were able to see like the perfect like what you see on the screens and like the news and social media that is what you saw with your naked eyes it was incredible and so during totality you were able to take your sunglasses off and i shit you not the bottom of the sun had solar flares like you could see the little red plumes um, coming off the edge there. And so that I will always, always treasure, treasure that. Uh, and I would love to hear your response. Probably be one of the, the questions I ask in the Q&A on Spotify. So I would just, again, love to hear your experiences. I think it's supposed to happen in the next 22 years. So it's going to happen again, but it's like a different, it's like Florida to, it's like Florida to Washington. It's like going, the arc is going in the complete opposite direction. So you might not get the same experience as you did this past week. Okay, this week in Star Citizen, we're gonna watch Inside Star Citizen uh, about Xeno threats. We're gonna talk about Wave 1 EPTU. We're going to then quickly go through the RSI Launcher 2.0 CitizenCon tickets, and then end with the monthly report and the Whitley's Guide to the Vulture. So let's get into this. This week in Star Citizen, let's go. Happy Monday, everyone. We released a big info drop on CitizenCon 2954, the biggest celebration of all things Star Citizen and you, the community. This two-day event will be taking place in the heart of Manchester, United Kingdom, at Manchester Central from Saturday, October 19th to Sunday, October 20th. Caveat, the VIP event is Friday the 18th. All right. This year's event is one that you will not want to miss, so get the skinny on securing your tickets, volunteering opportunities, community booths, the cosplay contest, and the exclusive CitizenCon Gala happening on Friday, October 18th. There you go. We've also included a nifty guide to Manchester to help you plan your trip to this dynamic city. Most importantly, we published a detailed FAQ to best prepare you for the big event, including information on what to expect, general show opening and closing prices, and more. On the Alpha 323 front, the team continues to work closely with Ivocati to tighten up the nuts and bolts on the latest build. We are steadily advancing toward getting Alpha 323 ready for larger PTU access, and we aim to open up Wave 1 later this week. So stay tuned. In the meantime, Jumptown is still safe. Or is it? 
It's running from now through April uh, 15th, so gear up and find out. The Overdrive Initiative has now officially entered Phase 4. Reports indicate that Xenothreat has infiltrated critical communication hubs. Members of the Civilian Defense Force are to remain vigilant and await further instructions via your Mobiglass. Your readiness is paramount to our mission's success in beating back Xenothreat. I haven't even touched Jumptown because I've been in Overdrive Initiative. <laughs> um, real quick, actually, when I was recording episode 52, literally the moment I stopped and saved and was in the publishing process, they announced phase four and all of its information. Well, I'm gonna do the same. At the very end of this podcast, I'm gonna check before ending, right? I'm gonna check and we're gonna see if the information's out and I'm gonna share it and then stop recording. But I can already tell you what phase five is going to be you're going to be doing a delivery mission to the pyro stanton jump point and that was teased in the inside star citizen video we're about to watch so we do know phase five is coming out today we do know it's going to be a delivery mission to the pyro stanton jump point but i will still check and make sure before we wrap up this podcast all right we're not going to go through the bullet points we're going to go straight into inside star citizen really quick the little blurb are you doing your part? We join the mission team for a look at the latest set of missions added to the persistent universe, the Overdrive Initiative. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Those of you playing Star Citizen for the last month have been experiencing a new kind of mission chain for a new kind of global event called the Overdrive Initiative, the five-part prelude to the return of a newly improved Xenothreat arriving in the upcoming Alpha 323. And so this week, we went to the folks who created it to discover their original intentions, to hear their reactions to how it's been going, and to get a look at what lies ahead for this and additional initiatives leading up to 4.0 and beyond. Pure chaos. I loved phase one. It was so good. Overdrive Initiative, codenamed Hex Penetrator, was an attempt for us to uh, dip our toes into new events and quest chains for uh, players to progress immediately or over a, a set amount of time. We're a live service. Uh, we need to do things that um, increase engagement and get players playing together. So the Overdrive was our way of experimenting with some stuff that's most common in other MMOs and trying to see if it's a good fit for us. It's a five-phase mission that prepares the players for the Xenothreat event. And it's one of the first times that we've actually kind of done a longer story. So they just said a, a five-phase mission. Like, we already know six. We know phase five is starting today, and it's the delivery to the Pyrostate and John Point. And they will also talk about phase six, or the final like culmination event, which is three missions in and of itself. So I, he says five phases, there's like six plus additional. We'll get into that here in a second. We line across multiple contracts rather than just here's just one. So in this case, we try to release the new missions weekly, but depending on feedback and, and, and information data, we either shorten it a bit or take a bit longer. And the idea is that we run it for a phase, it's somewhat grindable, content that gets harder uh, with each new one that you do. And it's all towards some sort of greater narrative. It's more uh, giving the players a deeper understand of the lore of the game and prepare them in advance to the sin of threat at the end of a long time mission qu quest chain. So let's start with phase one. The phase one was a data heist where the player had to go down and recover some data off of servers. We gave it a bit of a narrative spin where the CDF has detected a lot of their security bunkers going offline or being taken over by senior threat soldiers. And they're recruiting any willing and able body. And you have to go and infiltrate and get capture the data to figure out what they're doing. And keep the server room protected until the hacking is done. We 
balance this for all of the AI to be the tough part of it, along with the servers, so the further up through the mission chain you got, you got less time to recover each server and turn the cooling off. Warning. Security breach. Response. And you had more AI coming to attack you. One of the main key differences that uh, I had the joy of implementing is we took some of the tech from Squadron over, where it's not just Xenofret attacking you, but they're also putting a lot of pressure going into the server room. You might spot some of the Xenofret people actually rushing down into the server room to try and check all the covers to see where you're at. A lot of good feet. That's interesting. So we did notice that on Org Nights, um we explicitly call that out was like man the ai seems turned up a little bit um the rushing the rushing was interesting i did i did notice like a focus towards the server room um i saw a couple of enemy rushing but i didn't realize that that was uh S squadron 42 technology that was brought in it's very interesting back so far I think phase one went well. We did a lot it of work well. on like improving the AI. Some people getting the intended experience that we have designed where the AI are reactive, where everything's working perfectly. Some people have spotted some of the AI rushing to the server room and they were like, I didn't even know that AI can sprint at me. <laughs> like, is that new? And other people who are, you know, reporting the chip didn't insert or the AI aren't as reactive as we'd have liked. These are all things that we, we take down internally and we look to improve constantly to better the experience in live. People seem quite pleased with the new kind of flow of things and, and the AI being way more accurate and, and scary. Yes. More John Wick, less couch potato. <laughs> Depending on the number of players, it gets really tricky because there's a difficulty curve between the first time you try the mission till the last one. The first time is quite easy to get with two, four people, but since you get to the end, it gets really hard to achieve it. I've seen people take coming with like 20 to 30 people just to raid that one bunker, which is, in my opinion, a bit of overkill, but it's really cool to see. <laughs> Probably saw us doing so phase it. Phase two uh, is then a, a, a bounty recovery <laughs> mission. Where you have to go and find some of these Xenofred people. The Seabile Force detect that there is a, a Xenofred uh, target that has a decryption key that will allow us to discover uh, information about the Xenofred movement. But it's encrypted, and the CDF has then located some high-value targets from Xenothread, which are holding a decryption key. So you have to go out there, take them out, steal their encryption key. Target destroyed. And then bring it to one of the drop-off points. Kill them, steal it, and uh, deliver it. We can get more intel on uh, what Xenothread is planning next. These missions used to exist way back when in the PU, but they were taken out because they were broken. So we made an effort to fix these up and then reuse them in this phase. My main mission was to grab the bounty mission that we already have there and merge it with it. This um, this image you're seeing on the screen right now is like actually EVAing out to your um, like the thumb drive. You have to take the thumb drive, you have to obviously put it in your uh, inventory, you have to take it to a Lagrange site, but this was pretty difficult to do because the thumb drive was like lost in space you had the marker sometimes <laughs> you had the marker um, and if you flew towards the marker you would eventually find it but this thing it's already dark in space in the middle of like a you know cluster of stars it was very difficult to find but once you found it it was it was fine delivery one be sure like the decryption key was a spawner and do that merge between both missions into one main mission uh, style. Try the cargo channel. The idea was, again was these scale up and get more difficult as you go. But uh, on release, there was a bug which actually made some of them a little bit easier, as yes. I have <laughs> seen people and also had messages saying stuff like, hey, the Xenofret overdrive initiative, phase two's ace. Yep. And then 30 minutes later, might have spoken a little bit prematurely and then a massive wall about something that might be bugged so thanks for that army esports guy <laughs> one of the most ridiculous things that i saw on phase two is the uh, hover bikes people using three uh, dragonflies to take down the hammerhead which is just absolutely ridiculous i've i don't know what to say to that well, well done um we'll look to make the ai respond to dragonflies and actually like kill you because there's no way you should be able to kill 
a hammerhead in that vehicle. I have uh, <laughs> contradictory feelings because it's like I put so much effort on this mission and because of balance issue, uh, you see these people taking the mission in a different way. But in the other side, it's fun to see the pro players that we have challenge themselves uh, with our missions. <laughs> uh, gamers will be gamers. We'll, we'll find a way. <laughs> if things seem a little bit uh, easy or we want to, I don't know, create our own excitement like Org Nights with Soul Provision, we will find ways to, to make things harder than they should be. Taking on a hammerhead with three dragonflies is freaking hilarious. But I can also, I can also relate to his first sentiment of like, damn, you put in so much work as a developer, producer, um, in, in something that is just cheesed, right? It's cheesed because of a balance issue. Um, I could totally get that as well, but still had fun, still enjoyed it. Phase three is Xenothread being a bit more brazen. They realize that they're set up has not been working so well, so they're just doing all-out incursions. They're popping uh, up randomly around Stanton uh, with a massive combat fleet. The idea in normal MMOs is you turn up, you get entered into some sort of quest, and it's like, this thing's happening, engage with it. And if you leave the area, you sort of, the quest is removed. The incursion is our first step into trying to do that uh, with the current system we have. It's a challenging thing that you will need to get collaboration between the different players to be able to tackle down those ships. So the idea is you go to a location and there's lots of ships. And everyone, it's, it's, it's a server-wide event. So even if you've not done phase one or phase two of Overdrive, you can still do phase three. It won't skip your progress. You still have to complete the previous phases. But the idea of it's kind of a, this is happening right now in world for everybody. Everybody needs to get here and help us destroy all of these ships. What's interesting to me there is that when we played it, it was quite difficult and we needed to cooperate and stay coordinated to take down like the big amount of, of ships that needs to be killed. So not for me um, and, and, and some of our org members, it, it, this was also very easy. In fact, I continue to tell my org that phase two and phase three and the first part of phase four is soloable because the, this, this incursion is so spread out. Like it's one event, 24 ships. It's like broken into groups of three. So like there's, I don't know, I think it's three, but there's like eight ships per grouping. And they're so spread out that you can just go take out, you know, the, uh, the little groups at a time. It's not like you're facing all 24 at the same time. So I was able to cheese it by myself in like an F seven C Mark two. I don't know if there's that much cooperation. Maybe it was just early in the game because I, I do these like on the Fridays or Saturdays that they come out. So maybe it was before some fix. Uh, but this this was super easy for me. So as of recording this, this hasn't happened. Uh, what I expect to happen is that um, some lovely players will turn up in a bunch of dragonflies and just <laughs> make it all look like so. Thanks in advance. <laughs> How does this make you feel? Jared's putting a dragonfly on their faces. I love dragonflies, I got one. <laughs> in phase four, we kind of split it into two subsections. So phase four will have I really a, enjoyed that phase is four. a comma ray, and then there's like a four point A, which is uh, Correa. First phase is three comma rays back to back are being taken down by uh, Xenothread operatives. And then you have to go in and stop them. And in the meantime, as you're doing so, be ready to face some ships. Yeah, this was, this was exciting. You're uh, tasked to reactivate the comma ray. When you do, they're... Hold on, hold on. I gotta go back. Watch, watch this character. Hold on. Some ships. Okay, this character is going to EVA straight down to where they do the uplink and no, in no active live server can you EVA that cleanly. Hold on. Let's watch it. 
That's <laughs> they're guarding it, and you're <laughs> look at this guy. Uh, to look at this guy. The when you do, if that's me, I am bouncing off of every freaking surface, <laughs> triggering all the mines and blowing myself up. So, power to you. Good God. They're throwing everything they got at you. Um, try to reconnect to the Comoré. Obviously, these are crucial to the functioning of the law and communications around the planet they get taken down from, so you need to repair them. We've added some fun little surprises and changes to them, so it's not just gonna be your generic Comoré run that people are used to. And once the Comoré is reactivated, the turrets come back online and uh, help you in the fight. Apart from uh, the Comrade being guarded, it's also more focusing on the combat. We're throwing a lot of ships on you, as well as the Vanguard ships are hacking into the Comrade while you're re-establishing the connection. It's chaos. So you need to focus your fire on those ships before target. Also soloable, as long as you prioritize the Vanguards, you, like once they pop, there's like three of them. Once they pop, you go and destroy the vanguard immediately, ignore everything else. And then once you blow them up, it stops there accessing the system. And then your reconnecting will continue to move up. So just destroy the vanguards and you're fine. Taking all of the escort chips. Target destroyed. So the idea is that some players would be dealing with the outside defenses and other players would be trying to actually get in there and sort of make sure the comrade is handled. After you've done enough of these, it turns out that it was all a red herring. And actually they're doing an all out assault on Korea to wipe the entire criminal database and sow some chaos so they can plan something more sinister. Okay, last night's org night. We will not be publishing it, um, just because of adult conversation, not appropriate for, not appropriate for podcast. Um, but it was the first org night that was kind of a failure in the sense that for two hours we had this mission pop once, and then we couldn't get it to pop again. So there's a mercenary mission called like Urgent Retake Korea that I think this is just pure speculation. I think when it is live this priority mission cannot pop. And if that's the case, you've got to go in and do the urgent retake Korea before you can access this priority mission. So I think there's something here that needs to be addressed because again, for two hours, we were only able to, to do it once. And even then we failed because we were trying to get everybody to that location and the time ran out. It's a timed, it's a timed event. Um, it's kind of sad because like that was, we had like 16 people from Soul Provision ready to roll and we weren't able to get it to proc. Pretty damn sure that that is the situation. It's it's because there's a mercenary mission that's that's conflicting with it. Could be wrong. That was our experience last night. Which you're being tasked to all fly to Korea and take out the incursion of soldiers there. But I was able to do it earlier in the week it was me and two other people, D Rock and Groza. It's us three. Uh, so you're able to do it with a small fire team, but it is an infinite spawn closet. So you will fight for I think it was like 30 minutes. It was it's very long, in a good way. Again, great experience. Um, it was a lot of fun. A lot of lootable bodies. We saw maybe one or two of the limited heavy armor um, enemy so like that was exciting so if you're going to do it give yourself enough time to complete it number one and number two you once you're done you have 15 minutes before you're trespassing so when you're done spend time looting so get to korea with like a cargo ship like a c1 would be perfect um load up your c1 with all the limited edition heavy armor all the xenothread armor that you can um that would be my advice, but don't do this solo. I'm pretty, pretty sure it's not soloable because you are getting waves and waves of enemy. So phase five is our events refractory. Here's, okay, here's phase five. It's a supply request. This is happening right after this podcast. Period, just kind of cool off. And the reason we do this is actually a sort of tried and true game design thing where if we keep giving you constant action, uh, your dopamine levels are sky high and then stuff starts to get really boring. As such, people turning up in dragonflies to kill a hammerhead, clearly not enjoying this normal <laughs> game. They are salty about the dragon head, the dragonflies. So phase five is a delivery mission where you have to go bring supplies 
to the jump point from Pirate of Stanton, because you're aware the Xenofred's about to raid you, and you want to make sure you're prepared for that big battle. So what we do is we, we have little respites where the action peaks down and then we'll peak it back up. And because phase six is the whole Xenothreat event, which is a huge battle and it's gonna be hopefully very difficult, we have a little bit of a respite. Not too much when you do phase five and you have to do these sort of delivery missions, there will be AI there to try and stop you. But it won't be as big as a battle as the previous phases that you would have seen. Here's how you go around shooting people. The jump point itself isn't a whole lot different from any other station, aside from that it looks way cooler because, you know, we're building up, welcome to Pyro soon, P people will get to Pyro soon. <laughs> Landing complete. But it's also just a very, very, very far way for you to go. Because you're always supplying to Pyro, you don't know where you're picking your supplies from, so it can either be a very quick jump or it can be a very short jump. And now for phase six, Xenofret, which you've all played, but we've made changes to it. We have updated the size of some of the boxes, so they're a bit more difficult to handle. You have to be more aware. Some of them will require a dedicated tractor beam. There's a new commodity that will help you out within inside phase two of Xenofret, which is the protect and resupply of the Javelin. And then the showdown, has had a whole rework based on some feedback and some cool thoughts we had from the Capture the Idris event that we did. So I called this, I called this out a couple of weeks ago, a couple episodes ago, but I fully predict I did. I because because the Idris Xenothreat last year, eleven months ago, I think twelve months ago at this point. Um, the culmination event, right? You had to refill the um, Jericho. You had to refill Jericho, which is like a huge ass base. Um, you had to refill the Jericho, and then there was like a massive Idris battle that was like the culmination of Xeno Threat right outside. And I made the call because of Capture the Idris. I was like, I bet you anything, we're going to be boarding an Idris and taking out like almost like the 890 jump missions, like the derelict 890 jumps. I can almost guarantee you that the Idrises will be boardable and you have to do something on one of the Idrises. I called that out a couple episodes ago and then this is being confirmed. So Elliot Malby is confirming <laughs> um, that it's, this is the change. This is the change to the end phase of the culmination event of Xenothreat. So I'm super, super stoked. It also plays into my feedback for the capture of the Idris event where I just wanted to board the damn thing. I just wanted to go in and experience it. I don't necessarily need, you know, a free, a free Idris. I already have one. Um, this is going to be that opportunity to actually get onto the ship. And then once we're on it, I'm going to spend my time walking around it and enjoying it. So I cannot wait for this, what, next week or two weeks from now? Cannot wait for this. Another dragonfly. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil any more of that, so stay tuned. Try to board it. He says, try to board it in weeks. I'm telling you. So the overdrive is our first sort of foray into quest missions in an MMO. Uh, things that are meant to be repeatable, grindable, uh, meant to encourage the community spirit and people to play together. This is the kind of direction we were starting to head in when it comes to these quest chain missions. This won't be the last one you see. So what we're hoping to achieve with Overdrive Initiative is more quest change and mission linking, more in line with other MMOs that are on the market, which uh, for a more enjoyable uh, play experience instead of more disconnected modules and give a bit of a narrative flow to it as well to become more a game. One thing I'd like people to appreciate is that when Chris himself and Rich asked... Uh, that was an F7A. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. So this image, uh, this image right here, I, I saw the paint job. It's that um, camo digital print. I was, and then it has a turret on top, which the F7C Mark II does not. I'm like, that's a F7A. And then I confirmed it. One thing I'd like people to right appreciate is here. So on this screen, you can see the Anvil F7A Hornet Mark II. So here's your first look at uh, the F7A in combat. Very cool. 
that when Chris himself and Rich asked That's gonna us be during sick. some of the reviews as we were making the missions, they asked how the balancing went and if it was difficult. And both Elliot and I's response were, well, for us, it's really, really difficult, but we are kind of terrible pilots anyway. <laughs> I saw players in the forum you and me both. saying that they have now a motivation to every Friday go back to the game yep. and tackle the new mission. 100%. For the development side, what we're trying to achieve with this is just uh, new ways of making missions, make gameplay for players uh, more fun. We're constantly evolving and making the game better. Uh, seeing feedback, we have our own internal thoughts of how we think it well, we've done our post-mortems, and we know how we're going to improve it for the next one. So from here on out, it's only going to get better and better, and we're going to see more and more quest chains come in. Nah, I can't wait. So what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that the Overdrive Initiative has been a fun new addition to the Persistent Universe that touches an entire host of gameplay features for Star Citizen that if there's one thing you can always count on, it's that the star citizens themselves are gonna find emergent solutions to the challenges at hand. And that while this may be just the first gated mission chain for the Persistent Universe, it definitely won't be the last as it sets the stage for a proper welcome to Pyro during our journey to 4.0 this summer. And if you haven't played the Overdrive Initiative smart. yet, there's still time to play all five phases starting tomorrow and running until the release of Alpha 323. For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. Thanks for letting us share the process of game development with you, and we'll see you all here next week. And then they're about to get into the namesake of today's episode, the code name, Hex Penetrator. You have to explain Hex Penetrator. Um, so Hex Penetrator is an anagram for pre-Xeno threat, but we know that people data mine our source code, so I just came up with a random anagram that was very inappropriate. Um, I didn't think it was going to last, and then, unfortunately, once it was there, people all started referring in documentations like, oh, so the Hex Penetrator mission's this, and like this, that, like this and that, and I was like, well, I can't change it now. It's going to confuse everybody, so my lasting <laughs> legacy in this company is a mission called Hex Penetrator. How does Fritz Roberts feel about this? He laughed, then told us to change it, and we forgot. <laughs> Oops. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> Love it. Love it. So my reactions, first off, there's a reason why I have been naming um, each one of these episodes, Xenothreat Part 1, Xenothreat Part 2, and then today's episode is um, Hex Penetrator. This has been, um, at least for Soulvision and the organization, this has been an incredible, an incredible experience. Um, the soluble missions are great. Like I, like today's drop of like doing the um, supply runs, it's gonna be cool, calm, and collected. I'm gonna probably grab a C1 um, or maybe even like a fighter that has a small garage, depending on how many packages that I you know I need to I need to garner. Um, probably do it solo. But these org sized missions, especially for phase six, when we're getting into the actual Xeno threat raid, um, this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. It's you know living in space, getting you know a, a an orbital station or the pyro station jump point, getting it equipped and ready to go for a raid. I can see that being a lead up to a raid, um, in like World of Warcraft, Elder Scrolls Online, Guild Wars Two. Like I, I can see there being raid prep, and then the raid drops and it's something that you pull in your org for. Yeah, it's just this is it. This is it. And then when they're not doing the raid, you're living and existing in your base, right? In your base or in your Odyssey up in space. It, I, I can't not, <laughs> I don't know, I'm a fanboy. I, I make a freaking podcast for this game, but I can't imagine playing any other game when this goes live. The amount of just existing and immersing, immersing yourself in this universe having these reasons to come back quoting the, the video reasons to come back every friday to gear up for some major server server wide raid it's it's incredible and it's all being done in space and it's all being done with technology that we've not seen before at this scale in any other game <sighs> okay i did my due diligence i am on the overdrive initiative page and right now it's still just phase four. So we don't have the 
actual release of phase five just yet. It'll probably happen within the next hour. Okay, let's transition. Let's transition into the wave one. I'm gonna share my screen. screen. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen uh, for, for wave one. <laughs> Star Citizen Alpha 323, here are the patch notes. This dropped yesterday, um, no, dropped two days ago. Maybe it dropped yesterday, I don't know. I'm getting my days mixed up. This dropped earlier in the week, <laughs> um, and I did. Oh, yeah, it was two days ago because I was battling between this and um, the Fallout series. So this drops, and just, I'm gonna get the elephant in the room out of the way. Um, it's horrendous. If you try to play in 323, just remember your experiences during 318 and let that be your bar. Don't expect anything more than the 318 experience but okay that's it I'm, I'm just i'm gonna leave it there that's that's the, that's the negative side of wave one alpha 323 in the eptu the good news is it's in eptu <laughs> it's it's wave one so this is not live it's not out for the pu um but it uh it, it's it's hard it's hard to just get off the damn planet so i chose new babbage just to change things up i usually am in crusader so i chose new babbage and i have yet to been able to actually get off the planet um, just because of the different issues an elevator killed me that hasn't happened in a year um, so that's whatever uh, in and of itself an issue but my experiences um actually let's go through the patch notes and i'll go through my experiences so here we go so the right now it's in wave one We'll eventually see, I think next week we'll see wave two, and then like each week will be a wave. I still predict 323 will be a mid-May, right before the end of May's Invictus launch week. It's our prediction here at Beyond the Verse. Uh, but wave one right now, um, they have a note, this patch does not contain all of the intended features, um, but what is being tested is Stability, which is the main focus. I have an actual anecdote for that in a second. Master and operator modes, full character customizer revamp, the Moby Glass rework, star map, interior map, mini map, EVA, which I haven't been able to get out of my ship in space to really experience yet, the new loot screens, new visors, new lens, full FPS combat refactor, dynamic crosshairs, backpack reloading, haven't been able to experience yet, physical shopping UI, haven't been able to experience yet, and then the new arena commander featuring engineering game modes, grav royale, new racetracks, new pirate swarm, etc. All right, let me go top to bottom. My actual experiences in 323, so stability. First off, horrendous, it was, it was bad. Um, but I do have a good story. So I pulled out the F7C Mark II. That's what I was going to fly to Port Tressler. Tressler is is the orbital station for Microtech, I'm pretty damn sure, I think. Um, I think it's Port Tressler. Um, I was going to take that, and right before I got into the Mark II, um, it basically 30 k but it looked and experienced differently. It said server error, and it just kind of froze you. It didn't say 30 k it said server error, it froze you. I took a screenshot, my post on social media was the replication layer at work. I don't know if it was the replication layer or not, I don't. But the purpose of the replication layer is during a 30K when the servers go down, you're being replicated on kind of a standby. So you're not dropped from the game, you don't lose progress, you don't lose anything. So then when the servers come back online, you're replicated back into the server. And that is exactly what happened. So I'm only assuming that the replication layer was at work. So it froze, server error, I decided to wait didn't back out of anything and sure enough I got reset back to coming into the hangar so I wasn't at my mark two I was like reset back at the beginning um, so basically the server started to go down when I entered and it just reset me back to that entry point so that was that was great I mean it was about a minute minute and a half I waited for for quite some time but it was a great experience rather than being kicked out, going back to the main menu, coming back into the main menu and potentially being in a habitation and having to come back through all the trains at New Babbage again. So I thought that was great. I thought that was a great experience. However, you know, the next day when I was trying 323 again, there was an actual 30K that kicked me back out to the, the menus. So I don't know, it's still wave one. I have a lot of patience when it comes to especially the EPTU. 
let's move on master modes i haven't been able to get up in space really i took a the second day i took a hammerhead don't ask me why i was, i don't know i wanted to do something bigger so i took the hammerhead up to tressler um didn't get into space because of, of other reasons but as i'm flying towards tressler you know i could see that the user interface was different i could see where i could change or toggle between the different flight modes uh, but again i haven't really been able to to experience combat with it yet i have an arena commander i've been able to test master modes um, but not in this 323 build but it is available can't wait to experience it the full character customizer revamp Yes, I had a lot of fun with this, and so did a lot of other content creators um, or social media accounts. I was able to create basically me. So long beard, long wavy hair. Um, I was able to create, you know, what I've wanted to create in the game for a long time now. Different levels of beards. You can highlight and create grays because I got clearly I got some grays going on in my hair. Um, but I've also seen some pretty crazy and crazy being in a good creative way. Um, I've seen some crazy creations as well. Um, I actually saw a really good Disco Lando or Jared Huckabee, you know, um, uh, attempt. And it looked actually really close to him as well. This is a great, great character customizer. Um, again, the anchor points and being able to grab an anchor point and modifying it the way that you want to is incredible. The makeup, the highlighting, the different colors. I mean, you've got pretty much the world at your fingertips. I can't even imagine when you're able to create an alien species. Like, can you imagine creating a Vanduul or a Banu? Like, I, I can imagine that being pretty incredible as well. If that's even an intent to do, which that's an ongoing question I have. Um, so that was really awesome. And then when I got into the game, the first thing I noticed was this next bullet point, but the Moby Glass rework. Beautiful, futuristic, what I expect out of not only a 2024 game, but really what I would see in 2954. Like it seemed very elegant, rich. Um, things were moved to the sides and below, so I felt like I could see more of the screen. It's aesthetically pleasing. It's not too bright or too in your face where it detracts from your environment. Um, and it does change per helmet. If you put on one helmet, put on a different helmet, it's a different experience. If you don't have a helmet on at all, right? There's just some very interesting dynamics. Um, you even have like a leveler, you know, like when you're in your ship and you're, you're, um, you know, you're pitching, um, you're able to see like your, your altitude or your, um, the direction that you're facing that exists on your helmet as well. Don't necessarily know why you would need that. Um, but those exist. So it just, it's a, it's a crazy experience. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is like the map, the mini map is phenomenal. Um, don't really want to go too far on that because in other episodes I have, the mini map is phenomenal, beautiful, great. The one downside is there's still a lot of like work to be done in the nomenclatures when you open up your map. There's a bunch of coding. Like there's a bunch of like names that haven't been converted. So coding that hasn't been converted to its actual name. So it's a little detracting. It's a little um, off-putting. It's hard to kind of maybe search for uh, the location that you're trying to get to. Um, so that's just, you know, again, they're working on it. EVA have been able to see it, Loot Screen have been able to see it, FPS Combat, Backpack Reloading have been able to see any of that. Um, I was going to later today get into the Arena Commander features. The Engineering Game Mode is super interesting to me, so I'm going to dabble in that later today and over the weekend. But here's your Wave 1. Hopefully my experience has kind of set the stage for when you get to play it. I know some people in our org, they have access to it, but their computers died, so my heart goes out to you. <laughs> get that fixed as soon as possible. Um, so again, just wanted to share this with y'all, and I'm pretty sure that is it for the patch notes. Don't want to leave anything out. Stand by. Yeah, we're gonna call it. We're gonna call it here. The next tab is the actual patch watch. Um, so there, they spotlight you know selections um, of upcoming features. And so here, there's scopes, right? They highlight the scopes that are coming, the economy um, updates, vehicle prices, balancing passes, um, FPS weapons prices. So if you want to get into this, this is uh, in Spectrum. Again, it's just highlighting like changes that you can expect to see in the next couple of uh, weeks, okay? Um, 
I didn't think anything was like so uh, podcast worthy. It's just they're making changes to a lot of the balancing for the economy. Scopes are kind of interesting. I have, uh, I'm, I'm gonna say it again. I'm gonna say it again. I have always had an issue with scopes and games. This is the one, the one experience I have in the military that I cannot break in my gaming experience. The only thing that should be zoomed in is what you see through the lens, not everything else around you. So like that, that, I don't know, that bothers me. It bothers me that when I'm in a game, I look down my sights or I look down my scope and everything else outside of the scope also gets zoomed in. They blur it, but it gets zoomed in. I, oh, I don't know. I think it's hard to emulate in a video game. It would be very distracting to emulate in a video game, but until, until, you know, some developer or producer figures that out, um, it's going to always be detracting for some of us veterans who are like struggling with that. So again, the only thing that should be zoomed in is what is inside of your lens and it should be disorienting. If you have a eight times multiplier scope, you should not be able to see a clean image through that unless you look through it, right? Unless you hold down the right mouse button. And once that pulls up to your eye, that should get clear. And the rest of the view should stay where it's at, not zoom in. It should stay where it's at and then blur. Maybe darken and blur. I don't know. I have a hard time with scopes. <laughs> Just trying to be transparent here. All right. We're going to go through some quick updates. The RSI Launcher 2.0, Citizen Con tickets, and then we'll get into... We'll actually switch the end. We're going to get into the Vulture and then the monthly report. Uh, we're already about an hour into the podcast, so this is going to go pretty long. So let me share my screen. This is the Launcher 2.0. Uh, it's on your comm link, so get into the comm link. There's a download now button. I'm actually going to open it for you so you can all see it um, and you can hear it if you're on podcast. But here's the RSI Launcher 2.0. You click this download now button. Here's some imagery. Here's a screen um, that shows what it is. Of course, it's more aesthetically pleasing. It's more what you would expect in 2024. Um, the layout is a lot better. Um, in this little uh, wheel, like the settings wheel next to the live PTU, EPTU, um, the, the tech preview channel, like where you, cha you change your, your game environment, you're able to actually uninstall the game from the launcher. That's huge. That's different, right? Um, so here we go. Let me just read some of this. Welcome to the start of the Launcher 2.0 adventure. We hope that you enjoy it. Thank you as always for your continued support. What's new? Content section. Access, ooh, there's a play. Oh, cool, I didn't realize you could play and watch things. Cool. So, um, and I realized I can't go backwards now. Good job. So that was content, so there's like a scroller, uh, or shoveler is what we call it on the Amazon website. So we have a shoveler that you're able to go through and see content. This next one is real-time status, so get notified right away when one of our game services is down or under maintenance. I'm just gonna keep playing it. What's next, what's next? Is that it? Uh, environment selector, so cleanly switch between any of our numerous game environments directly from the launcher. Downloads manager, track, pause, resume, or cancel multiple downloads all in one convenient place. RSI menu, easily access app settings and other useful links to help fine tune your experience. Game settings, to find specific settings for each environment all from the comfort of the launcher and back to the content section. Very cool. All right, the future evolution. The new launcher will be in continuous development. This is why it's in quote unquote beta. And this initial launch provides us a strong basis for the future. You will begin to see new features coming your way, which will range from simple quality of life improvements to brand new functionalities. So yeah, so delete your local settings. This will be huge because they always recommend you delete your user folder or delete your shaders folder with every patch update. You can do it here from the launcher now in, in a next evolution. Cool, 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 cool story. Uh, help <laughs> help us make it better. Uh, every time we do, or everything we do in the community is community driven. It is an important part of our development process and is quits uh, essential to who we are. To that end, we've created a new launcher issue council. Nice to report any bug you may find. Please tell us what you think on Spectrum. And then there's an FAQ. 
I'm not going to go through all this because we are short on time, uh, but there we go. So you can go to the comm link, look at the 2.0 FAQ section yourself. Uh, the next page is the actual download page. Uh, let me just show you real quick what it looks like. So as I open this up, whoa! That got super loud. So let me turn that down just a little bit. But here's what it looks like. So as you come through here, new citizen comm links, patch notes, back to the community. Here's your live PTU, EPTU, uh, game environment selector. When you click the cog wheel, um, here's how you verify you know, your game files, downloads applications, you can change, enable close to quit. That's cool. Um, but it's just a lot more, again, what you would expect to see out of a 2024 um, launcher. So there you go. Let me just exit the app, volume back up, and let's get going. Cool. And then really quick, here's your RSI Launcher 2.0 release notes. This is straight from Spectrum. So again, the website, go to Spectrum. Why is it beta? All the information that you want uh, to potentially read up about the 2.0 launcher. All right, straight into the CitizenCon updates uh, or the ticket updates. These are now available. Uh, they've been available for a couple of days now. So you only have a few more opportunities to get your tickets. Um, here we go. Ticket wave schedule. The early access for concierge and subscribers started on April 11th. That was yesterday. So wave one, April 11th at 1600 UTC. Wave two, April 12th at midnight. Wave three, April 12th at 0800 UTC. So by the time that you're listening to this podcast, the early access is done. So general sales starts today. So wave one, April 12th at 1600 UTC. Wave two is tonight. So April 13th at midnight wave three is april 13th at 0800 utc and then it gets into the extraordinary two-day event now what i will say is it's super expensive uh you got these um premium experience price is 350 dollars but somebody posted on somebody posted on social media that these are actually oh no no, no it's still 350 okay so yeah, so here's your premium experience ticket. Somebody had sent an image of it being over $400, and I don't necessarily, see this is why I go to the source. Always, always, always go to the source. It is $350 for the premium ticket, $250 for the general access. Always go to the source of truth. All right, I'm gonna switch things up. I'm gonna go to the Vulture first, and then we will end with the monthly report. Um, just so for those of you who don't necessarily wanna to listen to all the different details of the March monthly report, you can wrap things up after the Vulture. So here we go. Whitley's Guide, Drake Vulture. I will say it again. This is the one Drake ship I will tolerate. It's actually a really, really fun um, solo play loop. It's one of my favorite. Actually, it is my favorite solo play loop. I love getting lost in space, salvaging a ship. Even if it's one of the simple paid for uh, salvaging missions, it is a shitload of fun. So let's read about it. This was originally available or appeared in Jump Point 7.8, Drake Interplanetary, Interplanetary Vulture, The Hunt. Here we go. Most spacecraft have a common point of origin. They're developed to military specification or they're designed to fill a market need for civilians or corporate groups. The Drake Interplanetary Vulture has a different story. Its development originates from a rush to complete a treasure hunt. On the 9th of August, 2895, the Terra flagged freighter Empire Slipper suffered what was later determined to be an unlikely cascade of system failures, which resulted in the bridge terminals receiving a completely incorrect set of navigation overlays. The error caused Slipper's navigation officer to chart a course into a dense asteroid belt within close proximity to the danger zone of a red giant's corona. A debris strike subsequently disabled the aging freighter's shield generators and unfortunately delivered a dose of fatal radiation to the crew. Empire Slipper was left adrift, its specific location unknown. As the freighter was known to be carrying a wealth of precious metals and a consignment of rare artwork, intense media interest and a massive search and recovery operation followed. After eight months of searches, a UEEN picket 
ship. Don't know what a picket ship is. Identified the wreckage of the slipper adrift in the irradiated debris belt, putting an end to conspiracy theories that the freighter had been hijacked. However, it quickly became clear that the region was practically inaccessible to any dedicated salvage ship with enough protection to survive the operation. Misk, the transport's builder, offered a 10 million credit bounty to anyone capable of recovering the black box data recorded in an effort to explain what had happened. Unexpectedly, upstart spacecraft manufacturer Drake Interplanetary came to the rescue. Seeking both the bounty and the salvage rights to the slipper's cargo, an elite team convened on Borea to create a makeshift spacecraft capable of solving this peculiar problem. Wow, I said that completely oddly. An elite team convened on Berea to create a makeshift spacecraft capable of solving this peculiar problem. The basis for this one-off construction was an existing AS-1 Cutlass prototype, Vertical Landing Test 3. With all testing equipment removed, Vertical Landing Test 3 quickly became a specialized platform intended to reach the Empire's slipper and recover its cargo. Heavy shield generators replaced much of the prototype ship, standard cargo capacity, and a pair of versatile remote manipulator arms were bolted to the prow. The result was something unlike any other spacecraft currently flying, an overshielded, underpowered amalgamation that was small enough to navigate the debris field while keeping its crew of two safe. What's more, VLT-3 could engage in the necessary salvage operations using its external arms without requiring EVA, which was made impossible by the amount of radiation involved. 14 months after the Empire Slipper disappeared, Drake's test crew began salvage operations from a hastily established modular space station positioned just outside of the danger zone. After the course of 36 perilous expeditions, VLT-3 repeatedly entered the debris field and carefully removed the slipper's flight recorders and then, one by one, the valuable cargo containers. Drake claimed and received salvage rights for the valuable cargo and promptly delivered the recovered flight recorders to MISC. However, the promised 10 million credits did not materialize as Drake executives were ultimately taken to court over the bounty when it was discovered that they had covertly opened and copied the flight data aboard a runner ship before passing it along. Classic Drake. <laughs> Production models. The success of VLT-3's mission wasn't only beneficial to Drake's bottom line, public fascination with the lost freighter gave the company's recovery mission significant airplay and was seen as a positive reprieve from the corporation, which was battling accusations of profiting from piracy. For a time, Drake was seen as a positive, if rough, force, just as the small personal spacecraft market was beginning to heat up. To play off this success, the company sent VLT-3, its paint seared off and hole covered with micrometeoroid impacts, on a nine-system PR tour to be displayed at aerospace shows and museum exhibits. Excitement over the feat faded, and Drake soon found itself again mired in controversy. VLT-3 was put back into storage just as the corporation was again accused of supporting piracy following the coordinated destruction of a misc hole D by four unmarked cutlasses. The company seemed to have little interest in the formal development of a salvage ship and instead moved its focus to the Caterpillar command ship concept. In 2932, an Aegis Dynamics reclaimer, the General Dog's Body, made history with the single most profitable salvage mission in human history when it discovered and recovered a failed 22nd century colony ship adrift in deep space. The ship's crew became millionaires and minor celebrities overnight, and the event prompted much greater interest in the previously uncelebrated task of space salvage. As interest in salvage boomed and crews began pulling money, into, uh, money to purchase their own reclaimer platforms, Drake executives realized they already had a more appealing option in their back pocket. A team of aerospace engineers led by Drake's in-house designer, Saad Perkins, began work on developing the VLT-3 concept into a standalone salvage spacecraft, 
While the new design would be built from the ground up and would need and wouldn't need the heavy shielding of the original, the overall layout and functionality would remain surprisingly similar to the prototype. The early manipulator arms were replaced with what Drake would ultimately call rippers, standalone salvage booms supported by a Lariat tractor beam and a Tomium scraper rig. These booms would allow the craft, soon named the Vulture, to identify, move, and cut space salvage and then store it in the ship's rear bay. Like VLT-3, the production Vulture was oriented around shipboard controls rather than EVA support. The crew capacity was reduced from 2 to 1, reinforcing the idea that a single pilot could operate a Vulture and potentially make their fortune the same way the Dog's Body's crew had. A small rear living section would allow the solo operator to endure long voyages, as salvage sites were rarely close to well-traveled space lanes. Finally, the Vulture would feature maneuvering thrusters and an oversized shield generator to enable it to make careful movements not possible with larger ships like the Reclaimer. Drake premiered the Vulture in 2938 with marketing that called back to the success of VLT-3, including stylizing the spacecraft's name as Vulture, V-U-L-T-U-R-3, in some advertising. Public interest in salvage and personal fortune seeking continued and orders quickly outpaced the production capacity at Berea. Within eight months, Drake was forced to open two remote factories to meet demand. While the company was roundly accused of overpromising inexperienced captains the chance to turn incredible profits by competing manufacturers, Vultures immediately found success with the discovery and parting of several high-profile uh, high holes. These included a Genesis Starliner, long thought destroyed, and two hole A's that had collided and spun away from their planned routes in an unexpected manner. These stories were major news and prompted continued interest in the Vulture. In 2941, Drake launched the first updated model of the Vulture. While the first civilian released while the first civilian release had been completely unarmed, in 2941 model added uh, the, the 2941 model added a pair of size one weapon mounts, which appealed to pilots who'd be flying the ship in unsafe and unexplored areas of the galaxy. In 2943, the UEEN requisitioned 300 vultures for battlefield support operations. The military versions weren't hardened and didn't feature additional weapons as they were never intended for use in combat. Delivery of these ships began the following year where they immediately saw service within the first fleet support arm. Clearing destroyed spacecraft in the wake of ever increasing battles with the Van Duel. Drake has continued to develop the government version of the Vulture, as the expectation is large-scale naval battles with only increase in frequency and furor in the years to come. The most recent civilian update was made for the 2949 model year, with the launch of the now standard extended cab, which ups internal cargo capacity from 8 to 12 SCU. Drake currently offers a low-cost dealer upgrade for earlier vultures to convert them to roughly the same capacity. A similar process has been made available for adding weapon mounts to the initial 2938 version. I, this is why I love the lore. I did not know that the VLT, the vertical, vertical landing, hold on, what does it stand for? Stand by. The VLT, we just read it. It's like vertical landing takeoff. Vertical landing test. <laughs> so the vertical landing test three, the VLT three, that VLT-3 was changed to Vulture. That's why you have a Vulture. That is really cool. It's a really cool play on the uh, on the words. Anyways, getting lost in that detail. Um, I, I I love how I love how the ships that we fly in Star Citizen are kind of a hodgepodge of what the government or military is using, but it's made like quote unquote for civilian use. Like the F7C, not the Mark II, but the F7C, it's like a playoff of the F7A, like F8C, 
right? These are plays off of what is being used by the military. And in very rare occasions, do you have access to the actual military version? Um, I, I like that. I like not having um, all the tools at my disposal. I like the idea of a military coming in and helping like during, what is it? Is it Invictus launch week? I think it's Invictus launch week where they do parade the Bengal, right? The Bengal flies around and they have that, you know, Idris's hammerheads. They have all the supporting vehicles around it. Um, I like the idea of those being fully kitted, fully outfitted with things that we can't necessarily have uh, as gamers. Because again, I think that would be an incredible uh, presence, you know, makes you actual fearful. Like you should not have access to the things that the UEN or the UEEA has access to. So I am a full supporter of that dynamic. Okay. If you are deciding to leave and take off, have a great rest of your week. We will talk again next week on episode 54. But for those of you hanging around, let's get into this March monthly report. <clears throat> let's see if I can do it without dying because this podcast has ran very long. This is going to probably end up being a two hour podcast. So stand by. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Okay. <clears throat> let's see if we can do this without dying. The monthly report. Let's go. AI features. In March, the AI features continue to fix bugs, make improvements to human combat and other AI behaviors. AI tech. Last month, AI Tech focused on finalizing and polishing features for the Alpha 323 alongside optimizations for existing systems. For example, work on, on planetary navigation was completed. I love seeing the word completed. Work on planetary navigation was completed with the, with the team now able to generate navigation mesh over entire planets. Yes. To achieve this, the devs use the same concepts the physics and planetary tech teams use for representing planet terrain patches. Compared to the previous implementation where planet navigation tiles were represented as cube or parallel piped, parallel piped, good god, parallel piped, as used in traditional navigation volumes, <clears throat> the new method uses a volume with a skewed square rhombus base. While this brings new challenges, such as how two neighboring triangular navigation tiles will connect. It allows navigation mesh to be generated everywhere and on all types of planets and moons. For Boyds, the team continued to implement new rules and finalize synchronization between the server and clients. They also worked on traditional or additional iterations with design and polish the feature for release. AI Tech iterated on new ship behaviors with design with the aim of greatly improving the AI combat experience, substantial improvements were made to aiming control systems for ships and turrets and to perception thanks to the addition of support for missile detection. Elsewhere, improvements were made to the navigation link system to reduce the computation cost over a frame by better utilizing the new navigation anchors concept. Subsumption loading logic improvements were also submitted that will more clearly show possible problems with the data so the designers can fix them sooner. On the AI tools side, the team continued to improve and iterate on Apollo. This included implementing a new version of the sticky header tree that shows a better representation of file folders with behaviors and missions. The animation team has been working on the space cow a medium-sized bird, a predator wolf-like creature, as well as several new vehicle entrance animations. Love it. The art team, art characters. In March, the character art team completed a range of branding racing flight suits, yes, and continued working on outfits for the Headhunters gang. The character concept art team began exploring specialist armors and worked on handoff sheets. So I, uh, the flight suit that I, that comes to mind, and I don't think it's a flight suit. I think it's like a jacket, but like the origin, the origin racing jacket. Um, I, I want more of that. I do. I want more of that. The ship art team. March saw progress on the RSI Zeus. Gray box was completed and all functionality has been validated with the ship currently in the beauty and polish stage. 
Habitation in the central hallways made significant progress and are approaching completion while the cargo hold continues to progress with the loading ramp's main piston structure improving rapidly as well as the ramp interior and exterior. The landing gear is nearly complete and the overhaul exterior continues to progress too. The Anvil Legionnaire is white box complete with the team currently waiting on gameplay validation and for artists to free up before they send it to full development. The team's work on resource network began, yes, with 10 ships nearing completion, some of which received the updated list of ship items. Following gameplay validation, relay locations will be polished. Uh, for those of you unaware of resource network, that's it's basically like the engineering loop, right? How um, how actual components inside of your ship behave and the resource management of it. Update work on the legacy ship continued too. Wonder what that is. With updates to the dash, cockpit, and some exterior housings. Ooh, that's exciting. All right, community. The community team kicked off March supporting the Overdrive Initiative and Stella Fortuna, the latter with a banner design contest challenging participants to craft logos for in-game or fictional competitive racing or combat teams. Check out the incredible entries on the community hub. The team also spent time helping prepare the RSI Launcher 2.0 for live release alongside a myriad other support tasks to prepare for Alpha 323 4.0 and beyond. In the latest roadmap roundup, uh, more details were shared about the upcoming Alpha 323 patch, while Alpha 322's Test Universe champions recognize outstanding players who dedicated their time and effort to the current patch's testing phases. The team also supported various community events. Let's keep going. The community team continued detailing the weekly schedules with This Week in Star Citizen, a series of comm links that inform the community about Star Citizen's developments and initiatives while also highlighting creations for the community. This month, the team added a new weekly chapter featuring four top creations from the community hub. CitizenCon preparations are still underway with the show layout to general activations taking form. The team is excited about what already is shaping up uh, to be our biggest and best event to date. They also published a variety of post post posts regarding all things citizen con such as the citizen con faq to better help players plan their travels and attendance finally community updated the arena commander schedule which keeps players up to date with the arena commander's rotating game modes moving on core gameplay good god i have considered skipping this because this is basically 323 uh, and I will. I will actually go ahead and skip this. If you listened earlier and you heard the 323 patch updates, this is 323's patch updates. So I'm actually going to move on past that due to time. Um, all right, let's go through the economy. Last month, the economy team continued rebalancing commodities, making sure they have a scalable algorithm that will work with other systems like crafting. Mission rewards are, are being rebalanced according to the difficulty and time required to complete them. As part of this, the team are working to better understand how much effort and time is required to perform specific activities in game. In game, so there's probably a shitload of time studies being done, I, I can imagine. In-game pricing is currently underway for new harvestables, harvestables, I said that really quickly, and hangar flare as well. Economy, uh, economy are currently involved in the design and reputation of and org progression and are starting to balance the time and cost of auto-loading freight elevators. They also provided support for cargo missions. Finally, a comprehensive list of all intended resource sources, transformers, and sinks were created to help ensure the economy is stable for the long haul. So what stood out to me here is the org progression. I think org progression is going to be super interesting as we get more into what 4.0 and 1.0. Okay, graphics and VFX programming, Planet Tech. Throughout March, much of the department's focus uh, was on bug fixing and various deliverables for Alpha 323. Performance scaling options were added to the water simulation to ensure it can scale to all hardware. While various improvements were made to water boundary shading and visor wetness to achieve a seamless effect as players enter water. Support for distance field collisions was also completed for more accurate collisions from vehicles. 
The Vulcan team worked through several performance issues as they moved closer to matching D3D performance. Alongside this, the team are currently reworking shaders to reduce the total numbers of PSOs or shaders that need compiling when the game starts. Work on global illumination continued as well, with a focus on performance as the team moved forward or toward an internal rollout of the first version for testing by the art teams. The Planet Tech team started work on Planet Tech version 5, with initial focus on the groundwork required to set up spatial partitioning. Goodness, spatial partitioning. They're currently deciding how this will work with server meshing and server crash recovery. The devs also introduced the concept of default planets for the internal editor so that it's trivial for anyone to create and use a planet for testing. On the VFX programming side, in addition to water improvements, the team continued with networking support for the fire simulation. They're also making changes to the augmented reality render layer to enable support for holographic weapons. An example, muzzle flashes, projectiles, enemies, and impacts. In-game branding. In-game branding and locations work together on Invictus launch week with work approaching completion. Nice. The branding work for cargo containers and additional signage for various locations is also nearly finished. We're going to get into a series of pictures from the Interactables team um, because of 323 and having, you know, different storage containers, etc. So if you're watching on video, you have access to this. Interactables. Last month, item banks, now called gear storage, were finished, including a heavily worn version for Grimhex. They were then placed around the verse for convenient access. Looks really good. It actually looks kind of pyro, pyro-esque because of the gang tags. But uh, yeah, it looks really good. Explosive containers were reworked and now replace static meshes and levels. So they will now explode if players shoot them. That is really, really cool. It's about time. So these uh, flammable um Markings like these containers are actually explodable. That's awesome. Fire extinguishers, uh, sorry, fire extinguisher recharge cabinets progressed through gray box and are currently being taken to final, while cargo hover trolleys are being finalized in preparation for the cargo hangar update. Lighting. Alongside tasks for instanced hangars, freight elevators, and distribution centers, Lighting worked on Invictus Launch Week. They also supported an upcoming character customizer, including addressing community feedback to solve some long-standing issues. Locations. Last month saw the locations team polishing content for Alpha 4.0. They also closed out the upcoming distribution centers, adding content and quality to give players the best possible experience on launch. They also kicked off reproduction for new mandates officially beginning in Q2. The Landing Zone team finalized art for instanced hangars and prepared them for implementation across the verse. Mission Design Last month, the Missions Features team was restructured, becoming the Mission Design team. Despite the name change, the team will continue to build scalable module content for the PU. Following feedback on the Overdrive Initiative event, this team is revisiting the standard data heist missions. Currently, th these missions are locked to a single player who then can share the mission with their friends, which causes a bottleneck for the missions and locations. In response, the team are trialing a change that will allow a singular version of the mission to be accepted by four players who will play together as contractors. This is an effort to free up missions and locations that create a similar effect to Overdrive Initiative where people who usually play solo are part of a team, potentially building friendships and enhancing the MMO feeling. Work progressed on the upcoming cargo hauling missions, with players being tasked with hauling tracked goods from one location to another as requested by a shipping company. With a consistent payout of roughly 20% of the cargo's value, a hauler income will be more stable than that of a commodity trader. Still, once a cargo hauler gets comfortable with the profession, they might try their luck at commodity trading. While the player is legally allowed to transport the goods, they do not own them. As a result, lawful stores across Stanton will not buy these commodities. To sell the shipment rather than delivering it, the player must navigate to a fence, a no-questions-asked shop, often located in an unmonitored area of Stanton, so Grimhex, 
<laughs> However, due to its tracked nature, this cargo fetches a significantly lower price than ordinary sandbox commodities. With the upcoming addition of wildlife to the PU, Mission Design began work on related content, building three mission variants. Number one, kill X amount. Number two, clear location. Number three, kill and collect. So let's get in all three. Kill X amount. This extermination population control mission tasks players with killing a predetermined number of animals on a planet. Players must locate the animals themselves. Number two, clear location. This will be a specific location that requires having its animal population dealt with. And number three, kill and collect. This is one of the first resource collection mission types where players must locate animals and collect their resources. Following a recent hire, some older mission modules were refactored. As such, the Destroy Illegal Satellites mission was received, uh, mission received a small facelift. Following further testing of Blockade Runner, a small change was made to ensure the event stays fun and engaging for all players. Work on the Xenothreat global events continued too alongside freight elevators. Narrative team. Last month, narrative continued to work closely with design to support a variety of content, from revising existing missions like the new player experience to outlining new missions being developed to support upcoming gameplay. The team continued to iterate on future narrative initiatives designed to bring more character and stories to the universe. This resulted in a series of proposals that they've been reviewing with design. They also continue to outline ways to improve AI behaviors to sell more of the Star Citizen lore. Narrative also met with some of the gameplay teams to talk over the loreification of upcoming systems. Another group of posts went up about the website on the website as well, including a Whitley's guide for the 890 jump. The narrative team also tackled a handful of questions from the forums in a new edition of Lore Makers alongside another batch of Galactopedia articles. Online technology. In March, the online services team worked toward refactoring the social services backend. This involves porting the services to GRPC, as well as making updates for server meshing. The team are currently working to reduce EAC anti-cheat false positives and preparation of enabling sanction enforcement. Lastly, online services finished off long-term persistence, work for the character customizer, enabling players to save their characters between patches. Love that feature. Research and development. In March, work continued on the temporal render mode. Tracking movement of objects moving through clouds was improved so that the history can be rejected or kept as correctly as possible. A novel method was developed because typical disocclusion, disocclusion algorithms only work for opaque scenes, but the team want objects to fly through transparent clouds, the, uh, be partially occluded by clouds and fog, etc. The generation and blending of soft depth for clouds and atmospheres was improved. This depth information is crucial to properly handling history rejection when moving through clouds. The team also supported the Gen 12 Vulcan Endeavor by analyzing the current list of pipeline state objects PSOs, used to render the game and suggested several ways to reduce it. These suggestions are being worked on by the renders team and will result in a shortened shader pre-cache phase the first time players start the game. Pre-caching is done to avoid shader activation related hitches during gameplay. Alright, three more sections. Tech Design. Tech design supported various areas of development to prepare for Alpha 323 and beyond. This included item banks, with the team making a new rundown variant entity, setting up state machines and animations, and iterating on the main screen and player interaction points and flow. Hangers were supported alongside ship flight, including iteration on new AI behaviors to make them more responsive to player actions. Master modes received polish too. Support was given a QA for visual scripting automation, and nodes were added for getting and setting player stats. For UI, Tech Design worked on test level setup in FPS crosshairs and hit markers, updating and polishing animations and fixing bugs. General bug fixing was also done, and various tools and workflows received improvements. <clears throat> User Interface Team 
Last month, the Montreal-based UI team worked closely with the core gameplay and UI teams on the new cargo gameplay updates. This effort encompasses the development of the new freight elevator kiosk, commodity kiosk, and item bank. They also began preparing mandates coming later this year, including the resource network and jump points. The UK-based team focused on adding the new player-facing UI to the game. The new version of the Moby Glass was made fully functional in time to get player feedback, with visual polish still ongoing. The new visor and lens received visual improvement while the last functionality elements were ported over by the programming team. UI also continued to polish the new shopping UI and character customizer ready for release. Visual effects. Last month, the VFX team finished their work on distribution centers and freight elevators. They also completed tasks, <clears throat> excuse me, they also completed tasks for several upcoming vehicles. Progress continued on jump point effects, including concepting, concepting based, good lord, including concepting based on new gameplay considerations that became apparent during testing. The team took another look at water effects to coincide with the graphics team's plans to release some of the water improvements that were shown at CitizenCon. Well, I almost got through it without dying. <laughs> Up until like the last section, I was doing uh, I was doing pretty decent. Um, I told y'all that I would check before wrapping up, so let's do that. Let's go real quick. I'll go to Overdrive Initiative. Ah, Mission Five is live. I called it. <laughs> Sharing my screen for those of you on YouTube. Mission Five is live. Here we go. Calling all pilots. Urgent assistance is required. Let's go. Where are you? <clears throat> Current mission. The CDF needs as many pilots as possible to defeat the increasingly deadly Xeno, deadly Xeno threat incursion. In response, all new recruits will receive a complimentary Kruger P-52 Merlin to aid them in battle against Xeno threat alongside other bonuses and perks. That's interesting. Didn't know we were receiving a Kruger P-52 Merlin. Uh, interesting. That's a referral. <clears throat> That is a referral. Let's check on it. The Overdrive Initiative Referral Bonus. All right. So if you're listening to this podcast and you would like a, uh, a free P52 Merlin, then use my code, which is star hyphen. It's a S-T-A-R hyphen. Niner four Sierra Tango. So nine four S-T hyphen. Bravo Kilo Foxtrot Mike. B-K-F-M. So yeah, that'll be in the uh, show notes. But here we go, current mission. Supply request, Xeno threat must be on to us, shutting down all operations and communique, co and communique, co communique? I have never seen that word. All operations and uh, let's just say communication in Stanton. CDF wants you to help call their bluff, resupply the jump point station and stay prepared for an imminent attack. Open your Moby Glass and accept Overdrive Initiative supply request. Cool. Totally called it. Um, exciting. So, on that note, <laughs> I hope this has found each one of you well. That was very um, improv, real time decision making right there. Um, if you want to become part of the conversation, you may do so by emailing us at contact at beyondtheversehq.com. Any questions, comments, concerns, we will read those emails live. You can also respond to our Spotify Q&A and poll at the end of this podcast. Uh, we normally ask one or two questions, and of course, I read them at the beginning of each show. You can also follow us on all socials. It's forward slash BTV underscore cast. Um, again, that's every social to include Blue Sky, which I guess is a, a thing at this point. And you can watch our videos over on YouTube. That's forward slash at BTV underscore cast. Again, I hope this has found you well. Until next Thursday, safe travels as you traverse beyond the verse. Take care, everybody.